Hello, hello everybody, this is TiptopMTG here today with another Magic the Gathering video. In today's video, I'm going to be going over all of the spoilers for Commander Legends that have come out today, today being October 28th. So this is the third day of Commander Legends spoilers, and there are some really awesome cards. So I'm going to talk about the new cards, the reprints, and I'm just going to give you my opinions on the set as a whole. Um, so, why don't we just jump right into this? Starting off, we have... Prava de la Legion de Acero, but obviously we need to translate this. So this is Prava of the Steel Legion. It's a three cost, a white legendary creature, cat soldier. It's a one four and it has partner. So this can be able to partner with another commander. And it says, as long as it's your turn, creature tokens you control get plus one plus four. So it's kind of boosting it equal to its power and toughness. And then if you pay three and a white, you create a one one white soldier creature token. Um, obviously this is a translation, it, not, the wording is not going to match exactly how it will actually be written, but uh, some things I want to talk about with this. I think this is really cool, especially that the fact that it's a partner. Um, a lot of the partners we've seen have been very boring, and they're clearly there for limited, like it is there simply because, oh, I need a blue commander, and it's better than the Prismatic Piper. But the thing is, uh, this one is, like, on a line, I feel like. It's not great. It's also not horrible. If you mix this with another, you know, partner who cares about tokens, I'm sure you'd get something pretty awesome. Um, I kind of just wish this... Uh, I, I almost wish it didn't give it plus one, plus four. I wish it gave, like, plus... X plus Y, where X is his power, Y is his toughness, or maybe just plus X plus O, where X is his power, or maybe his toughness, because he is more toughness based, and then you could have another commander that did it based on their power, and then if you have them both out, you can kind of mi mix the two together, um... And, and get like this cool little dynamic. I think that could have been cool. Um, I would not be surprised if we see another commander that gives plus four, plus one, that costs a lot more and is in like green. Uh, but yeah, overall, I think it's a good commander. I definitely could see myself building a deck around it, but I would really need to have a good partner uh, commander to pair up with him. Next, we have a reprint from Throne of Eldraine, that being Run Away Together. It's a two-cost blue instant, and it says, Choose two target creatures controlled by different players. Return those creatures to their owner's hands. Now, when I first talked about this card with Throne of Eldraine, I really only talked about it in a 1v1 scenario. But in a commander scenario, this is actually a much better card. I mean, in... In a standard scenario, essentially you're bouncing something of theirs and something of yours, which generally you're only going to want to do if you're playing creatures that have good like ETBs or whatever, um, but here it can be like two removal spells from two different players, all for two. Um, I actually really like it, and it's uh, nothing. It's something I don't really put in any of my decks, but I actually might. It doesn't seem that bad. Next, we have Court of Cunning. It's a three-cost blue enchantment, and when it enters the battlefield, you become the Monarch. I love seeing new Monarch cards. I think that Monarch is one of the best mechanics for Commander. It just it incentivizes attack. It makes gameplay strategy more dynamic, and I think it's really awesome. But it also has another ability. At the beginning of your upkeep, any number of target players each mill two cards. If you're the Monarch, each of those players mills ten instead. So, um, yes, yeah, so two cards each turn. I like the fact that when you play this, even if you lose the Monarch and can't get it back, it's not doing nothing. Um, but two cards isn't great. However, since it can hit any number of players, you could be milling between zero and eight cards from players. Um, because it doesn't say opponent, you can mill yourself, so I could totally see this going in like a Monarch, maybe self-mill, or maybe not even Monarch self-mill. This just works well in a mill deck. You're gonna mill two naturally every turn, and if you can manage to get some sneaky damage through with your utility mill creatures, then you can kind of start milling ten. Um, so... It is a little bit difficult to pull off, though, because it is a beginning of upkeep trigger, meaning you do have to play this and then survive to be the Monarch, uh, for a full rotation, and if, even if you lose it and can get it back, you have to basically survive a full rotation without losing the Monarch to actually get that Mills 10 cards, but if you do, you're milling someone tenth of their deck, whether it's yourself because you want to resurrect something, or your opponents to actually mill them out, so yeah, I like the card. Uh, more Monarch is good. Next we have Amphibian Mutineer, it's a 4 cost blue creature Salamander Pirate 3-3, three, three, and when it enters the battlefield, exile up to one target non-Salamander creature, that creature's controller creates a 4-3 blue Salamander Warrior creature token. So, a uh, very interesting and actually a very powerful ability because it can be flickered. I mean, if you're running a Thassa deck, this is essentially flicker kill something. I mean, yes, they get a 4-3, which is not nothing, but it's also not really anything special. It's not, it doesn't have, can't be blocked, it doesn't have have, I don't know, 
some weird ability. It's literally just getting rid of the abilities of a creature um, and maybe shrinking it in size. Now, you could be making it grow in size, and obviously Amphibian Mutineer can't really block those comfortably, but yeah, it's definitely a powerful card. I would not be surprised if it sees play in something like a Thassa deck or a deck that really wants to flicker like Rune. Um, now, then it also has Encore 6, which is great because if, say, you're playing with four players, you're going to Encore for six, and then you get to kill three things, um, and it doesn't have to be the one that it's attacking because it's an ETB trigger, and that's pretty cool. So yeah, I have overall, all of the new cards that have come out today, I think are really fascinating. I mean, in the past, we've had some that are just like, uh, I guess, but here, these are all cards I would love to put into decks. Next, we have um, Furry Phyrexian or Phyrexian Rager. It's a uh, three cost, two, two creature horror. When it, when, it, when, it, when it enters the battlefield, you draw a card and lose one life. Apparently it's hard to say that. I don't know why. Either way, um, it was last reprinted in Jumpstart. It's a meh card. It's clearly in here for limited. Um, not much else to say about it. So next we have Makeshift Munitions. It's a two cost red enchantment and you can pay one, sacrifice an artifact or creature and it deals one damage to any target. Uh, not a um, particularly amazing card. There are a lot better things you can sacrifice creatures to. However, this, uh, similar to one of the commanders from yesterday, works really well with the Encore mechanic. You pay the Encore cost, you get three copies of tokens that are going to kill themselves anyway, so then you can sack them before your end step and get a little bit of extra value out of them. So, yeah, um, anything that sacrifices creatures should really be considered with the Encore mechanic, at least for a limited environment. I don't think this is, if someone makes an Encore-based deck, which I assume there's going to be a commander that has Encore or, or cares about Encore in some way more specifically. Specifically, um, if someone does that, I don't really see them running this, but in a limited environment, it's not awful to then pay three mana to deal three damage to any target split. So, yeah, not bad. Uh, I mean, it's not a great card, but not bad in the limited environment. I definitely see what they were going for. So here we have Valakut Invoker. It's a three-cost red creature, human shaman, 2-3. And you can pay eight, and it deals three damage to target creature or player. This is very clearly limited kind of just filler. Um, yes, in Commander you may get to 8, but do you really want to spend 8 mana uh, dealing 3 damage? I believe that's to any target now. It's been errated. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that's something you're really going to want to do. Actually, no, I don't think it was errated. I lied. Maybe. I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, it's Obviously, I don't really need to talk too much about this card. It is a very janky, just, hey, I'm going to put this in my deck so, to fill out the slots, and if I happen to get 8 mana and have nothing to do with it, I'm probably losing, but at least I can deal 3 damage. Next, we have Meteoric Mace. It's a 6 cost red artifact equipment, and an equipped creature gets plus 4, plus 0, and has Trample. You can equip it for 4, and it has Cascade. So, uh, yeah, plus 4, plus 0, and Trample, not probably worth it for 6, plus an equip cost of 4. So you're paying 10 mana to give something plus 4, plus 0, and, and Trample. But you do get that Cascade trigger, which means you can Cascade into other things. So, yeah, pretty, pretty good uh, in a Cascade deck. Just... Any card, honestly, the more Cascade cards you have in a Cascade deck, the better. So that's always something to keep in mind. Next, we have this legendary creature, that being a Codis, Emberclaw Familiar. It's one in a red for a legendary creature, Elemental Wizard, 1-1. One, one. And whenever a commander you control deals combat damage to an opponent, it deals that much damage to each other opponent. And then it has partners. So it alone, I think, is one of the best partners we've seen. Why? Because there's a lot of partners, like let's say the token one. Yeah, that's a really good uh, thing with another token generating partner. But those are kind of obvious combinations. Codis over here is just really good with almost any partner that wants to deal damage, which is a much vaguer, broader category that can fit with a lot of things. So I would not be surprised if Codis, out of all the ones we've seen so far, becomes one of the most partnered with commanders. Because if you have any Voltron partner commander, any at all, all, this is partnering with it, most likely, because that would really help Voltron. Obviously, Voltron's kind of kind of want to win with commander damage, but if it can be, you know, killing two people with commander damage and then also killing the other two inadvertently, that's a big upgrade. So keep an eye out for any caring about hitting people 
um because codis is going to want to partner with those people so yeah i think this is going to be one of the better partners i could be wrong though so i want to know your guys' opinion on codis i've talked with a couple people and some people think it's a really weak one but for me it's like it's a two cost and it just is it, it's so synergistic with a lot of different things also you may notice uh the custom frame because i've started translating cards into custom frames this is actually the f and m frame so i, I just thought i would kind of showcase the difference uh, you saw the little animation. The only real difference is that in the middle, there's the Commander Legends logo instead of the Planeswalker logo, and the power and toughness of the creature is more red. But that's pretty much the big difference between the frames, which is kind of meh, um, uh, in my opinion. It seems kind of rushed. But yeah, I actually think Codis is going to be a fairly popular Commander uh, partner. Obviously, he's not going to be the star of the show, but he'll be a nice little addition. Next we have Port Razor. It's a 5 cost red creature orc pirate for 4 and whenever it deals combat damage to a player, untap each creature you control. After this combat phase, there's an additional combat phase. Port Razor can't attack a player and it has already attacked this turn. Okay, here's what I'm thinking. Without looking at any specific cards, well, I have one specific card in mind, Morag. Morag's a card that cares about how many times you've attacked, and it's going to boost your creatures based on that. So Port Razor mixed with Morag is going to just be extra, extra combats. Uh, essentially, if you can make Port Razor unblockable, he essentially can untap your creatures three times. A couple things to note, he untaps each creature you control, not each creature who attacked the player you dealt damage to, not each attacking creature, but just each creature. So even your little mana dork, that are just generating you mana are gonna get untapped. Similarly, you can send Port Razor at one person and then the rest of your creatures at someone else, and then send Port Razor at another person, and then all your creatures at that person you attacked the first time. So your opponent can really be mean to you if they let Port Razor just hit your opponent. Like, you're, if say you're the arch enemy and I play this, I can hit the other two people twice, and then I get three combats. Uh pretty insane card gonna want to go with morag it's gonna want to i don't know if there's any cards like this but if there's a way to switch like who it's attacking maybe um you might be able to do something interesting here i'm trying to think because it's about dealing combat damage so if you don't actually attack with it um hmm. does this go infinite with ilharg because ilharg what it does is it enters the battlefield and it sends out a creature attacking but then you have to declare who it's attacking so i wonder how this goes with ilharg because what ilharg would do is it would give you extra combats but i guess it wouldn't bounce it back to your hands so you can't just go back hmm this card is really perplexing and i would love to see what little combos you can do with it because i'm sure there's something Next we have so a vault, a sorry, a creature that has not been reprinted since from the Vault 20, and it is Fiend Fiendhorn, Fiendhorn Elves. It's a one cost one one creature elf druid and you can tap to add a green to your mana pool. So it's essentially Landowar Elves, but it's another version, so you can run Landowar Elves and these. So pretty good. Next, we have another elf. We have a Farhaven Elf. It's a three-cost green creature elf druid, and whenever it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a basic land card, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle your library. So just ramp on a creature. Um, in my opinion, not a card I would want to play. I, you kind of have to look at the mana cost. So for three, you could cast Cultivate, which is essentially... You're going to put the land on the battlefield tapped and shuffle your library. So would you rather have a 1-1 or an extra land of your choice in your hand? And that's kind of what you have to value. Now, of course, uh, when I'm comparing two cards, you can now run Cultivate and Farhaven. And of course, this is just a reprint, so there's not too much talking about this. But uh, not a big fan of this card. Next, we have a Natural Reclamation. It's a 5-cost green instant. Destroy target artifact or enchantment and cascade. Um, yeah. I, they seem to be just throwing Cascade on standard effects. We had Counterspell, and now we have Natural Reclamation. So, yeah, I would not be surprised if we see, like, a cycle of, like, five or six cost, five cost, uh, like, you're gonna get a white one that's gonna, like, gain you a bunch of life. You're gonna see a black one that kills creatures. And then we're gonna see a red one that's dealing damage or something. Just something the color likes to do and in a very basic effect, but with Cascade. The advantage to this, obviously, is that you kind of get a two-for-one, even if the spell is more complex. My only issue with putting it on removal spells is generally when you need to use a removal spell, you need to use a removal spell. So having it cost so much, you know, yes, you're getting this added benefit from it. And obviously, using removal spells that interact with your commander and the rest of your deck is good. But if you can't use your removal spell because it costs too much, then you start running into problems. So uh, I think you really have to look at your deck and decide if 
this was worth it. I think it would be, but also if you cascade into this, mm, not a great target, and there's not a tar great target to go, and then you want to trigger the cascade, so maybe you target something you don't want. I don't know. I'm kind of mixed about this card, but generally, probably, you're going to want more cascade cards than not, so who knows. Next, we have another reprint. This is Imperious Perfect. It's a three-cost green creature elf warrior, and it says other elf creatures you control get plus one, plus one, so it's just going to boost all your elves, and then you can pay a green tap and create a one, one, which, uh, because it's an elf, will actually be a two, two, as long as the perfect's on the battlefield. Really good in an elf deck. Why? Because it's generating elves. That's generally what they want to do, and it's boosting them too. So uh, this is pretty much a removal magnet, and it's pretty good. So it's good to see it be reprinted. We've seen a lot of elves in black and green, so I would not be surprised if that is the black and green limited kind of theme. So that's interesting. Next we have Numa Joraj Chieftain. It's a three cost green legendary creature elf warrior and it says at the beginning of combat on your turn you may pay XX. When you do distribute X plus one plus one counters among any number of target elves you control and then it has partner so clearly gonna want to partner with like another elf or something that cares about plus one plus one counters which we do have some dual color commanders. I believe it's black and green so you could do black and green elves uh, that care about counters a little bit more. I don't know, um, XX is kind of tough, but green has been getting a lot of ramp, and elves also love to generate tons of mana, so it's probably a good thing that it is like that. Uh, I would rather play like Marwen, who's gonna do that generating of a lot of mana, and maybe put this in the deck instead of being the commander. Next we have Immaculate Magistrate. It's a four cost green creature elf shaman and you can tap and put a plus one plus one counter on target creature for each elf you control. So it works really well under a Marwen deck because Marwen's going to care about her power and it's going to care about the number of elves and then add mana equal to that. So pretty good there. It was last reprinted in Commander Anthology and for those of you who don't know, whenever a rare or mythic is a reprint, I put the value of it uh, um, in USD as of card kingdom's prices as of today, meaning that if you're watching this in the future, this price has probably gone down. So yes, I know, um, I feel like I always get these comments, and it's fine, it's just the prices are going to go down from the time of release and pro when you watch it, probably. So next we have Kamal's Will. It's a four cost green instant and it says choose one. If you control a commander as you cast the spell, choose both. So we had one of these called Spots Will. Uh, and so it looks like we're getting a cycle or at least a part cycle. They don't have to technically finish it. Uh, and it says until end of turn, any number of target lands you control become one, one elemental creatures with vigilance, indestructible and haste. They're still lands, or you can choose target creature. You don't control each creature you control deals damage equal to its power to that creature. Um, so, interesting, the bottom one is essentially going to kill your- if you can cast both, you are getting a pretty big army and then you're killing them. My issue is that you're like paying four mana, and then do you untap your lands? No, because uh, otherwise this would be a free spell. So, you gotta have a decent amount of lands to actually cast this and have it va be valuable, but if you can get both effects, you kind of just get a removal spell. Not awful in mono green as a good removal spell for creatures, but I think you really need to be doing something with those lands. So, yeah, I think if you can do something interesting with the lands, definitely, but it's not as, uh, crystal, like, it's not as good, in my opinion, as Spots Will, who is, both effects are just generally pretty good. This one, it's like, eh, well, you, you, you're you paying four, and then you need to still have your, like, lands open to do things, and they're only one ones, and I don't know. Next, we have Kamal, Heart of Krosa. It's an eight-cost green legendary creature human druid. At the beginning of combat on your turn, creatures you control get plus three, plus three, and gain trample until end of turn. Hey, remember how I talked about if there was a commander that liked hitting your opponent, um, that you should run it with that other commander? This guy could maybe do it. I mean, he's an 8 cost, so that's a bit insane, but and then you can pay 1 and a green, and until end of turn, target land you control becomes a 1-1 one, one elemental creature with vigilance, indestructible, and haste. It's still a land, and then it has partner. Um... So this is very clearly kind of replicating part of that previous effect, or actually probably the previous effect is replicating this, but what's interesting is this is actually replicating at Kamal's original card, which had both abilities being activated. This kind of just bumps him up two mana, makes one ability passive, and then uh, ups his power and toughness and gives him partner. So is it worth being mythic? I think eight cost commanders are a little bit insane. It's going to cost eight, then ten, then twelve. But you are in green, so this is closer to running a six cost commander, or maybe even a five cost. 
I don't like running six cost commanders too often because I feel like I don't get to play them, but because of the partner on this one, I think it's a little bit more excusable because you can have that maybe other partner that's doing things in the mid game and then Kamal comes down and kind of wins you the game. Um, I could totally see this mixing with the token partner we saw uh, earlier who's going to generate a bunch of tokens, boops them up, and then this guy's going to hit the battlefield, boom, plus three, plus three, and trample. So yeah, pretty cool. And then maybe you can do something with the land ability. Again, this one's a little bit more reasonable because you can do it per land, but yeah, not a huge fan. Next we have Amarith the Lustrious. It's a six cost green, white, and blue legendary creature dragon, six, six. So if it's six, six, four, six with flying. And whenever another permanent enters the battlefield under your control, Look at the top card of your library. If it shares a card type with that permanent, you may reveal that card and put it into your hand. So this card is literally only card advantage. That's all this is doing. And uh, commanders can be fun to build around when you do that. However, it, it makes it very, very vague in terms of what you're doing. Now, of course, maybe you do have an enchantment theme, and so this makes a little bit more sense in there because you're going to have a bunch of enchantments. But if you had a commander that was just like, whenever you cast a creature, draw a card, that could be powerful. But how fun is it to build around? You kind of, I mean, it has... I could see both sides. I can see it being really boring because it's just like, well, now I'm just playing the best cards in green, white, and blue and hoping to win that way. But I could also see, well, that means it's open-ended and you can build whatever you want just using this as a basic color shell that helps you draw into the cool cards. So if you wanted to do some weird theme of, I don't know, tribal uh, as a card type or something, I don't know, you could definitely use this. So I, I do see both sides to it. It just, it's a little generic and boring. Um, but of course that whole matching permanent types does add some value here, as well as knowing what the top card of your library is. That's also pretty good. Next we have a card, and this card is named Zara Wind Raider. These, by the way, are all translations whenever you see it fade to something with a circle for the rarity symbol, uh, so things could change, wording could be slightly different. It says, it's a legendary creature, human pirate with flying, and whenever it attacks, look at the defending player's hand. You may put a creature card from among those cards onto the battlefield under your control, tapped and attacking that player or planeswalker they control. Return that creature to its owner's hand at the beginning of the next end step. So yeah, you're essentially just looking at their hand, which is already really awesome, and then you get to take one of their creatures and hit them with it. And this can really backfire if your opponents aren't playing creatures, but generally they probably are. Now, you, of course, you do need to be able to attack with Zara in order to get this trigger, um, but I do think it definitely has some room, room for interesting interaction. For instance, anything that flickers a card and returns it to, quote, your control, not to its owner's control, can you can flicker it and then permanently gain control of it. So if someone has an Elish Norn, first off, that's devastating because it has kind of an instant impact when it hits the board, but also then you flicker it, and then you get to keep it forever. So I think I'm gonna build a deck around this, like legitimately probably one of my favorite commanders they've revealed so far. Next we have it, your lock. Uh, of the Burn Thrash. It's a one black, green, red for a legendary creature via Shino Shaman, and it has Vigilance. And if a player loses unspent mana, they lose that amount of life. And then pay one tap, each player gains black, red, green. So essentially, this is adding mana burn back to the game. Uh, and this kind of is also one of my favorite commanders they revealed because it is so interesting. It is so different than anything they've done. What is your game plan? Your game plan is to make your opponents generate tons of mana. Now, how can you do that? Well, you can do all sorts of weird and intricate things. I mean, technically, you could play Braid of Fire and then give it to your opponent once it has a bunch of counters on it and they're losing a bunch of life. You can use his bottom ability, which is both ramp and damage to your opponent, because if you do it on your turn and they don't have any way of spending their mana at instant speed, you can use it to kind of ramp yourself two and to hurt your opponents for three. Um, a good way you can do this is you, if you're not attacking, is you can pay one tap um, what was I, uh, you can pay one tap, add the mana, and, like, you can do that on someone's end step, where someone may not have a response and deal damage, or you can use it to ramp. Overall, it is very different than anything we've seen, and that's why I really like it. It's interesting to look around and say, how can I make my opponents generate a bunch of mana? Next, we have Go Gore Muldrock, Amph. 
Amphenologist. It's a three-cost Simic legendary creature, human scout, and it says you and permanent you control have protection from salamanders, which means that you can't be attacked by salamanders. And then at the beginning of your end step, each player who controls a the fewest creatures creates a 4-3 blue salamander warrior creature token. So you're giving everyone else creatures including you could be getting them too, but they really can't attack you, which is going to encourage your opponents to attack each other. There's going to be feuding starting, so even with their non-salamander creatures, they're going to start attacking each other because, well, oh, you attacked me last turn, so I have to attack you this turn. Um, of course, they don't have to attack, which is a big problem with this card. They can sit around and be sacrificed to the sacrifice deck at the table. Uh, so there's definitely issues with this because the sacrifice deck can kind of always make sure it gets the Salamander Warrior. And if that's the case, then your commander is kind of sitting there doing nothing other than protecting you from the random Salamander Changelings. But yeah, also pretty good against Changelings too. Um, but uh, it's okay. It's interesting, but I don't know how great it really is because of that whole sacrifice archetype being a thing. Next, we have an artifact called Horizon Stone, and it's a five-cost artifact, and it says if you would lose unspent mana, that mana becomes colorless instead. So this is the effect that Crufix... Uh, has that essentially just turns all your mana to colorless mana instead of you losing it, which is really, really awesome because it lets you build up mana over turns. And you might be like, well, mm, yeah, I, I can run this in a deck, but I can't rely on always getting it, so I can't build the deck around it. So what's the point? Well, first off, any deck that's sharing lots of mana may want this just to keep around, but also you can throw this in a Crufix deck. It's kind of like throwing Fist of Suns in a Jota deck. Um, yes, Fist of Suns has the advantage of being cheaper than, like, Jota himself, but also it's good to have redundancy. Yes, I may pull Fist of Suns while Jota's on the battlefield, and it really doesn't do much. By the way, Fist of Suns has the same exact ability as Jota to pay, you can pay five a mana or Wooberg instead of the uh, uh, cost for spells, but also now if my opponent kills my Joda, I get an artifact version, and so this is very similar. Of course, Crufix has Indestructible and is sometimes not a creature, so that definitely protects it and may make this less valuable than, say, Fist of Suns, but I do think it is an interesting card, and it's colorless, so it goes into any color, which I think is a big deal. The fact that blue can now kind of have this mega ramp on its own is kind of crazy. And that is going to do it for this video. Today was a much shorter day of spoilers, um, but they were definitely more interesting than yesterday. I mean, yesterday we had some great spoilers as well, but a lot of them were reprints, um, and, you know, they just weren't as awesome and fun and fun to just talk about how you could build. If you guys have any comments about any of these cards, let me know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed the video, hit the like button. And if you want to see more awesome content like this and even more, uh, hit that subscribe button. I will see you guys in the next one.